Hey, this is Pastor Jerry at Crestview Wesleyan in Ashboro, North Carolina. I want to thank you for joining us, whether you're watching us via Facebook or YouTube. I really appreciate you joining in today. I just want to say to start out, Happy Father's Day to all the fathers that are watching today. I hope you have a, a wonderful Father's Day. Uh, this is this year is the first year that that I'm having Father's Day with without my father. He passed away a, a few months ago, and you know I'm I'm just thinking about it, and and I'll just say that that I am so grateful for the memories of of my dad. I'm I'm reflecting on what a wonderful dad my my dad was, and and uh, the thing is about my dad, I have a lot of peace today because I know that. My daddy is is having a wonderful Father's Day with with God in heaven. So uh just wanted to to just say happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Uh today's message is going to be in Mark chapter 10 and it is it could be considered a Father's Day message. I'm going to be talking about marriage and what Jesus has to say about marriage. Just a great message. Man, I've learned so much from studying this message this week. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 10, and we're going to be reading the first 12 verses. So please follow along with me. It says, Then Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, as was his custom. He taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Jesus command you, he replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. Jesus replied, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. So, this story right here that it starts out again, we see two of the common things that's going on in Jesus' ministry. For one, you see this great big group of people, this crowd of people. And another thing that you see commonly in Jesus' stories is you see Pharisees hounding him, hounding Jesus. And it says here in verse 3 that the Pharisees were testing Jesus. So if you look up this word tested and you know about the stories in the gospel, especially when it was considering the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they, they were up to no good. They, this testing here actually means that they were hostile to Jesus. So they were trying, their question and the reason they came to Jesus was not to get information, but it was to try to trick Jesus and and to try to trap Jesus you know I was thinking about it how to maybe think of this story and think of the Pharisees in in modern times today and what would be a good example of that and you know I don't watch hardly any news programs these cable news programs at all and in any news at all I read a little bit on the internet but what what is going on with these Pharisees right here is is kind of I believe a good example would be like uh, the press secretary at the White House that, and, and I mean I've seen it over different presidents and whatever, and and these reporters it seems by and large these reporters that come and ask questions, they're not asking questions to get information about what's going on in the White House. It just really seems like their questions are bait. It, the cre questions are tricked. The questions are to try to get get them to stumble. That's exactly what the Pharisees were about right here. They they could care less about Jesus' answer. All they wanted to do was to trick Jesus. So 
their question was to Jesus was, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Well, on the surface, it seems like a legitimate question. But again, they were up to no good. And, and this word tested means that they were up to something hostile to Jesus. So you know something's up. And then if you think through it a little bit, you really know something's up. Because they these Pharisees, they know the law of Moses well. They are well, well versed on the law of Moses. So they already knew the answer. They knew the answer because Moses said in the law that divorce is, is permitted. So if you, if you do a little bit of research like I did, you can go to the Gospel of Matthew. In the Gospel of, of Matthew, there is the same story in chapter 19. But the question that the Pharisees asked went, went a little bit further. And it, it helps us understand the point and and why they tried to trap Jesus with this because their question as we read in Mark chapter 19 verse 3 is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason so th- thinking about this uh see the as always in the times i mean it's going on today as it's going on in Jesus time there are people who have different interpretations of scripture there are different uh, there's religious people that are out there that interpret things more liberally and others when they're looking at scripture they interpret things more conservatively and and this is going on right here because the more conservative pharisees the more conservative religious people believe that divorce, the only way you can have divorce is from adultery. But again, there's some that believe that you can divorce a woman, a man can divorce a woman, as Scripture says in Matthew 19, for any and every reason. And and I just read, when I was reading through this, I mean, you could literally, Jewish people could literally, back in the day, the more liberal ones, interpret it. It could be any reason at all. So if the the wife cooked a bad meal or was a bad cook in general, you're out. If uh, it talked about even if a a woman uh, didn't clean the house like she was supposed to, she's out. It even said that if a man found, was roaming around and found a more suitable wife for him, in his mind he found a more suitable wife than the one he's got right now, he could divorce his wife for any reason. So you see how this could just open up a big old can of worms here. And, and this, and they were intentionally trying to put Jesus in this great big old ball of fire here. And just, because if you think about it, any answer that Jesus would give would cause all kinds of controversy, would just stir up the pudding, it would just be turn into just chaos. And they knew that. And they thought they had Jesus trapped. So it's it was it was just a, a big mess they were trying to get him into. And what Jesus did is he was brilliant because he responded to their question with another question. In in verse three, what what did Moses command you? Well, they were ready for this this answer because they knew the law of Moses well and they knew in Deuteronomy, uh, the law of Moses says that, and they they actually uh, paraphrased this, and they said in verse 4, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. So in other words, they said, you know what? Get rid of that woman. Get her out of here. You, you can divorce her for, for whatever reason. So... I mean, in in some of their interpretation, they believed, uh, they looked at the law of Moses as as a get-out-of-jail-free card. That's just the way they looked at it. You you know, one of the things that that is important to me when I'm working on and I'm developing messages is I do a lot of extra reading. I mean, I read scripture, I read these verses that I'm preaching about over and over again, but I 
look at commentaries and I read other materials. It tries to help me to understand the scripture better, to understand the context, to understand the the times. Uh, a lot of things that they're trying to get to understand this. And th- you probably see this a lot. There's this one commentator that I think is, in, in my opinion, the best commentary in Mark. And his name is is James R. Edwards. And and you see, he's he's got I think the right take of the way the Pharisees are looking at, at this at at divorce, and and their 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 logic. This this writer here and Jesus goes to explain this. Their their logic is so messed up, and and he puts this 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 commentator puts this in a in an understandable way. So we can see how messed up these Pharisees are by bringing up divorce. And and this guy, this commentator said this, it would be the way the Pharisees are looking at marriage by thinking only of divorce would be like an airline pilot training to be a pilot by only studying about how to do a crash landing. You get it? It it would be like a, a soldier... That that the only way he would train for war would be to find the best way to retreat. Do do you see what what is going on with these Pharisees? They're not thinking about how God ordained marriage. They're thinking about how do I get out of marriage? What God has ordained us. So j- just listen to this: the exceptional measures necessary when a marriage fails are of no help in discovering the meaning and intention of marriage. See, the Pharisees ask what is permissible. Jesus points to what is commanded. And and I'm thinking about this. Y'all stay with me here for a minute because I'm thinking about this just about divorce here. I'm thinking about this a whole lot more broadly because we as Christians far too many times are guilty of asking the question, what is What is permissible? In other words, what can I get away with and still be a Christian and still be right before God? I mean, the questions, and I've heard them over my life, how much can I drink and still be a Christian? Can I smoke and still be a Christian? Um, how much bad language can I use and still and still be considered a Christian? Is it okay to gossip every once in a while? And still, what is permissible, right? How much, how much overweight can I be and still be a Christian? So our our question is is wrong headed. When we ask the question, Christian, listen, what is permissible? What because what we're asking is, what can I get away with? That's that's the wrong question, and this is what Jesus is doing right here. What they were doing was asking the wrong question, and what. What our question should be, Christian, is how how do I love God more? How do I love my neighbor as myself? In following, not thinking about what is permissible, but how can I follow the greatest commandment correctly? Do you see? It's it's a paradigm shift. It's a change from the way we normally think. And this is what Jesus is doing right here to these Pharisees. So. Jesus saw the law about divorce correctly as an accommodation to human weakness. In other words, to sin. Jesus took the Pharisees back to the standard God had originally intended for marriage. Back to Genesis. Back to creation. Back to the pre-sin and the pre-fall. And and what Jesus has done right here is just absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. I mean, Jesus is God and Jesus has all the right answers and stuff and he, he knows how to respond to everything. And the Pharisees, all they were wanting to do was trap Jesus in this legal argument about the law of Moses. But, but Jesus wanted to take them back to what God really said about marriage and about how he ordained marriage. See, there, there's so much... There's so much wisdom here that we can learn from Jesus and Christian in how we respond to people. Because it's just like in Jesus' time, it's just like today, 
there are people around that all they want to do by asking us a question or confronting us it's just to stir us up. They they are not they're not asking us the question because they're looking for a legitimate answer. They're asking a question just to stir things up. Do you hear me? And Jesus was brilliant. We got it, Christian. You've got to use wisdom when it comes to people who are coming to you, and and all they want to do is to stir things up. Uh, in in our one year chronological Bible, right around now, we're reading through uh, Proverbs. There's a lot of good Proverbs. It helps us through things like this. Listen to this Proverbs right here. It comes from Proverbs chapter 26. It says, Don't answer the foolish arguments of fools, or you will become as foolish as they are. So the definition of fools here in Proverbs chapter 26 it simply means someone who doesn't want to know the truth. They're not looking for the truth. That is a definition of, of fools right here. So to answer the question of these Pharisees about, um, about divorce, Jesus changed the narrative from divorce to marriage by going all the way back to creation, to quoting scripture in Genesis chapter 1, the very first chapter in the Bible, and also in chapter 2, when it comes to, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to, to gender, and, and he's going back before the fall, before sin infected all of us, and, and he said this, and he's quoting, first of all, he quotes Genesis 1.27 when he says, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, and then he went further in Genesis 2.24 and he says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. So let me just do a little bit of a side here and say that over the last few years there's been a lot of discussion about gender and marriage. We, we hear a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of news about it. There's a lot of posts about it. There's a lot of stuff going on about gender and marriage. And, and what is the right answer for that? Well, what we see right here is Jesus clearly reiterating that he is, Jesus is clearly affirming what God said gender and marriage should be. So he's, he's reiterating God's perfect and sacred design of gender and marriage. Do you, do you hear me, guys? So Jesus, all he's doing is taking the Pharisees back and taking all of us back. Anyone who has a question about things about marriage, he's taking us back to what God ordained for gender and marriage. Do, do you hear me? Do you understand what Jesus is doing here? So Jesus is, is helping us with this. So moving on here, Jesus uh, completes the entire creation command in verse 7 and, and this is just so key here because this is what he says for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh this verse here if you don't if you don't study scripture and you don't really research this you don't quite understand the significance of what he's talking about about being one, about being one flesh. Because in, in the Old Testament time, and even in Jesus' time when he's writing this, this was a, a male-dominated culture. This was a male-dominated society. M men called all the shots. Women were second nature. They didn't right, have a whole lot of rights and stuff. And we see the perfect example of this because when Jesus asked the question about what did Moses say about divorce, Remember the Pharisee's answer in verse 4 was, man, I mean, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away, and send the woman away. So you can understand this male culture, this male first thing in Jesus' time and in the Old Testament time. But, but see, what Jesus is doing right here is he is confirming marriage as God ordained it to be. 
a, a husband and wife becoming one flesh. Their oneness. Listen to this. And, and what's, what, is, what is happening here is Jesus, by quoting Genesis, is declaring that a husband's obligation to his wife surpasses his allegiance to his father and mother, or, and I've added this, anything else or anyone else. The wife is, is his, his, his allegiance, making marriage second only to obedience to God and sacredness. So the, the other side of this too, thinking about this, this line by Jesus, marriage should reflect the oneness of the Father and the Son. So an, another aside from Pastor Jerry here, I, I've said this, that you, those of you who watch me, you understand how I revered and honored my dad. And, and the thing that, that so helped me with, with my dad, that so helped me with my Christian walk is by, by seeing the way my dad acted and the see, seeing the way my dad loved me and to see the way the dad, how I respected my dad, it got me to see a, a better picture of the Heavenly Father. The same thing, listen, the same thing goes in a marriage that is ordained by God when we follow what Scripture says about this oneness, Right? Because Jesus says this in John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. It's, it's united. It's the oneness with the Father and the Son. And if we, husband and wife, live this marriage as God ordained it to be, people will see, can see the oneness of the Father and the Son through the oneness of marriage. Do you see that? That's why marriage, guys, is so critical. That's why we are to, to love our wives. That's why we are to respect our wives. That's why we are to be united as one flesh, just like the father and son are united. See, see there's a whole lot more to this if we, we think about this some, right? And, and this is, again, this is a male-dominated society and in Jesus, what he's speaking about right here, and he's talking to the Pharisees about and the people that are listening, this is radical stuff because it's a male-dominated society and Jesus is just breaking the mold here and going back to creation, going back to the way God ordained it to be. It says, no, it's not male-dominated. They're equal. They're one. One of the things that, that I do as a pastor, I've, I've done a few marriages here at Crestview and one of the things that I do is, is I do premarital counseling. And my go-to chapter is always Ephesians chapter 5. And this is their, their section of it. It starts at verse 21 where it just talks about marriage and it talks about the family. And, and Paul gives just an incredible description about what marriage should be. And, and men, us men, when we think of that scripture right there, what comes to our mind just about every time, and about every time I counsel, counsel these people, the man it always thinks about this one scripture, wives submit to your husbands. And, and that's, that is about as far as they go. But if you read this scripture in context and read the first verse that starts this section on marriage, it says, submit to one another in reverence for Christ. So it, it's, it's the, the oneness, it's the equal, it's the submission to one another. Do you hear me, guys? Listen to this. It is neither man or woman who controls marriage, but rather God, who is Lord of marriage. Verse 9, Jesus says here in Mark chapter 10, what God has joined, what God, not man, not humanity, what God has joined together, let no one separate. It's, it's, God, is in, God should be in control of the marriage. He's the one. I mean, it's, I just love this stuff here. And it's just helped me so much just in this last week's study. I hope you're learning something. But we got to go to the last part, these last couple of verses here, because 
In verse chapter, I'm sorry, in chapter 10, the last two verses, I believe it's, I believe it's 11 and 12, that, that, he's, that Jesus talks about right here. He said when the, when the disciples got together with Jesus there at the end and was asking some questions, Jesus said this, you know what? If, uh, if you divorce your spouse and you remarry someone else, you've committed adultery. So in other words, you've committed a sin. Jesus is very clear on this. So how, how do we handle this? So does this mean that, that someone who is divorced and remarried again, are, 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 are they toast? I mean, we can see that. Well, let's, let's think about this. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about the context of Scripture, and I'm thinking broadly of this. So let me ask everybody a question here. How many of you out there watching me today has sinned? Raise your hand. <laughs> all of us has, right? We've all fallen short of the glory of God, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have. And so Jesus, again, we need to think of this in in the context of the Gospels, we need to think of, when we read through Scripture, we need to think this in context of Jesus and looking through the Gospel and, read, and seeing the big picture here. Because Jesus says this in Mark chapter 3, verse 28. He, he says this, that every sin, Every sin and every slander, it also says this, every sin and every slander can be forgiven. So what this absolutely means is adultery is sin also, right? So if adultery is a sin, Jesus says in Mark chapter 3 that it can be forgiven, right? So here's here's the thing. Listen, there's probably people who are watching today that that have been divorced and have remarried again. So you what what, what Scripture tells us, and what and the great thing about Jesus is because of Jesus and His forgiveness that because of adultery, because of any sin. That, that shackle can be removed. That shame can be removed from us because of Jesus. So don't think of Jesus as someone with a big hammer that's just waiting to pounce on us because of our sin. What I see about Jesus is, is his grace. We, we have been given something we don't deserve. That's what grace is. We get something good that we don't deserve. Jesus has given us this, Jesus has this incredible mercy. Mercy simply means God is withholding something that we absolutely deserve. We deserve punishment for our sins. We deserve all that, right? So adultery is just like any other sin. When we ask for forgiveness, Jesus for, can forgive us and make us whole. He can make us new. Do you hear that? Isn't that great news? That's great news for all of us, Christian. So guys, again, happy Father's Day. I hope you learned something. Those of you who are married that are watching today, understand the sacredness of marriage, that the, the oneness that, that Jesus says that we're supposed to have, that, that God talks about in the very beginning, in creation, in Genesis chapter 1. That guys, that's what we are supposed to, we were supposed to reflect that oneness of the father and son in marriage. And that's so critically important, isn't it? I hope it makes you think about your marriage and, and if there's some things you need to improve in your marriage that you work to do that. God bless you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the men here today, the fathers. We pray special blessings on them. And Lord, we, we thank you for the the sacredness of marriage and that, that Lord, that it is ordained by you, and, and it, is, it is so important. Lord, help us as, as husbands and wives to understand the importance of marriage and, and, and how, again, how sacred it is and to, to work to improve our marriage. And 
Lord, to love each other just, Lord, like you love us. And just bless each and every one today, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your word and your truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.